We've been through quite a few cases in this series where the victims are sex workers. And more often than not, it takes longer than we care to see to solve these crimes. Is it discrimination against sex workers? Is it the belief that they are mostly transient and rather than believing they've been murdered, it's thought that they simply moved on? Is it the dismissiveness of the police towards these women? Today, we'll be discussing a case that seems like it should have been solved faster than it was. But because of the sex work of a lot of the women involved, they were pushed aside until they could no longer be ignored. This is a brief history of Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. As always, this episode of A Brief History contains graphic content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Peter Sutcliffe was born on June 2, 1946 in Bingley, West Yorkshire, to parents John and Kathleen Sutcliffe. Peter was born prematurely, and it was unsure if he would even make it as an infant, but he did manage to pull through. John Sutcliffe was a known alcoholic and showed little to no respect for his wife Kathleen, which frequently upset Peter throughout his childhood as the oldest of six siblings. Peter had a deep love for his mother, but never stood up to his father for fear of repercussions. Through his young life, it was said that Peter preferred the company of himself rather than others, and was bullied relentlessly throughout his formative years. Despite the nastiness of the bullying, Peter never disclosed his issues to his parents, and instead made the decision to discontinue his own education in 1961, at the age of 15 when he dropped out. After dropping out, Peter worked various odd jobs to keep himself above water, and also continued to afford his habit of hiring prostitutes, which would continue throughout his life. Finally, Peter settled on working as a gravedigger at Bingley Cemetery, which eventually led to a job in a morgue. Peter loved working as a gravedigger and around the dead in general. Later, he would explain that he frequently worked extra hours and enjoyed watching the corpses, and even bragged to his friends about robbing bodies at the morgue. It is said that working for the cemetery was a turning point in Peter's life, and this was the experience that turned him into the sadist he would eventually become. In 1970, John Sutcliffe accused his wife Kathleen of cheating. This deeply disturbed Peter, as he had always seen his mother as a picture of perfection. Seeing the public accusation from his father, Peter would go on to believe that all women would inevitably cheat, and even his perfect mother wasn't exempt. Despite the aftermath of the accusations from his father, Peter married his long-term girlfriend Sonia in 1974. The couple attempted to have children on numerous occasions, but each pregnancy was quickly ended with a miscarriage, until Sonia was eventually declared medically unfit to bear children. At some point after his marriage, Peter was conned and teased by a sex worker. This was his first documented assault and is said to be the catalyst for the remainder of his crimes. In 1975, Peter Sutcliffe's crimes would begin to escalate significantly. On July 5th, 1975, Peter attacked a woman named Anna Rogolsky, who was walking alone at night. Anna was hit in the head with a ball-peen hammer, and her stomach was slashed with a knife. Luckily, a neighbor seemingly heard the commotion and disturbed the event, leaving Peter to leave without killing her. Anna survived, but was of course traumatized from the event. Just a month later, on August 15th, Peter attacked another woman this time Olive smelt. The attack mirrored that of Anna's, with Olive being hit in the back of the head with a ball-peen hammer and then slashed in her back with a knife. But again, mirroring the first attack, the scene was disturbed by a passerby and Olive was left alive but with severe trauma. Later that same month, a third victim, teenager Tracy Brown, was struck in the head with a ball-peen hammer five times while walking alone at night. A car passed by and Peter fled, leaving his victim alive but severely injured. Tracy required brain surgery to survive the night. Later that year, on October 30th, Peter Sutcliffe would murder his first victim. Wilma McCann was the mother of four children. Wilma was struck twice with a hammer and then stabbed upwards of a dozen times before finally perishing. Despite almost the entirety of the West Yorkshire police working the case and over 11,000 conducted interviews, Peter still managed to evade police. 
Over the next few years, Peter would go on to attack at least 17 women, killing 11 of them. Many of the women that were attacked were sex workers and seemingly under a lower priority for investigation, until the murder of 16-year-old Jane McDonald in 1977. Jane was not a sex worker, and showed the public that all women could be considered potential victims, not just sex workers. From 1975 to 1980, during his serial killings, police continued finding clues, including letters sent to the police and media signed Jack the Ripper, leading Peter to be known as the Yorkshire Ripper. On the 2nd of January, 1981, Peter's luck ran out, and he was caught by police with a sex worker named Olivia Revere's. It is found that during the stop, Peter's car had false plates on it, and he was subsequently arrested. Peter was brought to the station, and it was revealed that his name was on a list of 241 potential suspects for the Yorkshire Ripper case, and was subjected to two full days of interrogation, while police also managed to find a rope, a hammer, and a knife in his car. On January 4, 1981, Peter Sutcliffe confessed to being the Yorkshire Ripper, and gave detailed descriptions of the attacks and murders, solidifying his confession in the eyes of the interrogators. The women I killed were filth, he told police. Bastard prostitutes who were littering the street. I was just cleaning the place up a bit. On January 5, 1981, Peter was charged and pled not guilty to 13 charges of murder, but did plead guilty to a single count of manslaughter on grounds of diminished capacity, claiming that God had asked him to kill all of the women, as well as seven charges of attempted murder. The judge rejected diminished responsibility and insisted the trial be dealt with via jury. In the end, Peter Sutcliffe was found guilty on all counts of murder and sentenced to 20 concurrent life sentences. In 2010, he was issued a whole life tariff, which meant he would never be released from prison. Peter Sutcliffe remained imprisoned until November 12, 2020, when he died after refusing treatment after contracting COVID-19. This, of course, has been a very brief history involving Peter Sutcliffe, and the reality and gravity of his crimes can't even begin to be explained in this short video. Check the links in the description box for some of my favorite, more in-depth resources for learning about this case. Thank you for joining me for this episode of A Brief History. As always, thank you to my patrons for supporting this series. You are so appreciated. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more Sims true crime content. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.